Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be taking a first look at a brand new game which either comes out today or on April 26th. I'm not exactly sure. Um, the developer told me that it's coming out on the 23rd, which is why we're posting this video today. Um, but the Steam page still, at least as of recording this on the 25th or 22nd, still says the 26th. So uh, this game either comes out on the 23rd of April or on the 26th of April, but you can definitely check the link in the description to, to go to the Steam page and, and check it out there if it's for sale uh, or, or wish listed if it's not. Now, this game is called Cauldrons of War Stalingrad, and this video will be my first look at this game. It is developed by Maestro Syntec, and it is published by Gaming at Work. And you may remember Cauldrons of War Barbarossa, which I played quite a bit on this channel, uh, in the past, this is basically a turn-based war game that looks at the Eastern Front uh, in this game uh, during the Stalingrad campaign, just before the Stalingrad campaign and to the Stalingrad campaign, and then through to the Soviet counteroffensive uh, with op Operation Jupiter, which would eventually cut off and destroy uh, the German Sixth Army at Stalingrad. And so this is a game that puts you in basically the shoes of the high command of either the German forces or the Soviet forces during this 1942 and early 43 campaign. Uh, and really, I think, does an interesting job of making you make some key decisions uh, at a army group level or at a army level or core level rather than getting down into the nitty gritties. You're not dealing with a ton of, you know, where does this regiment go? Or, you know, how do I handle this division? It's all very much at sort of a, a top level command perspective. And the game really abstracts a lot of things that I think, you know, war gamers tend to be kind of rivet counters in a lot of ways. You know, people who look at games like Gary Grigsby's War in the East, where you have to manage absolutely everything, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. This is a much more limited game in terms of the kind of things you have to manage. But I think it does it in an interesting way that really makes um, makes the challenges kind of relevant to what generals of the time would probably actually be thinking about and considering uh, while their staff are doing all the other things that would be managed in a game like War in the East. With that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump in here and take a first look. Before we do that, I did want to let you guys know, because it's not on Steam, and I don't think it's on Matrix or Slytherin's website, um, unrelated to this game, because this game isn't published by, by them. Um, on my Nexus GG page, which there's a link in the description, there is currently a sale that's running for games like uh, Strategic Command World War One, which is 60% off, Strategic Command World War Two World at War is 60% off, uh, Armored Brigade is 40% off. So there's there's a sale that's running over there um, that I believe you can only get there. So if those are, you know, those are some examples of some of the games you can pick up. Uh, and if you are interested in uh, any of those kind of like war games, check out the link, check out the page. If you purchase through there, it helps the channel out, but you also get a Steam key and it's fully, you know, legit. I've checked with publishers. Uh, this isn't like a great key website. Everything is um, you know, 100% authorized through there. So if you're interested in that, check the link out in the description. Uh, I want to say the sale goes for three or four more days, um, but that's enough of that. So let's jump into Cauldrons of War, Stalingrad. Uh, we're going to be playing as the Germans. I think this game is best played when you're the one pushing the initiative. And you can see when you're jumping in here as the Germans, there's three difficulty settings. Normal is hard enough for me, so we're going to keep that. Um, keep that. There's also an interesting option that lets you see sort of the historical choices. So basically, what did the Germans do historically versus maybe some alternate history options. So we're going to check that. Um, and then there are five different campaigns that come unlocked with the game initially. Uh, and then there's also sort of a long campaign that you can unlock. And so the different campaigns are Fallblau, which is the German drive and, and offensive into Stalingrad, basically June to December of 1942. Uh, there is Edelweiss, which is the attack into the Caucasus uh, from July 25th to November, for, uh, November um, of 42. Uh, and then there is Uranus, uh, which is uh, Operation in Uranus from no from November 19th, 1942 to March of 43, which I believe is the Soviet counteroffensive. I think I said earlier Jupiter, but Uranus, which is, I believe, the Soviet counteroffensive 
uh, that, let's see here, with the Sixth Army mired in urban fighting in Stalingrad, the Stavka patiently prepared an ambition operation aimed at nothing less than the total destruction of Army Group B. The flanks guarded by uh, depressed and ill-equipped Romanian units are unprepared for the upcoming Soviet offensive. Yeah, so this is the Soviet counteroffensive that would cut off Stalingrad. And then Winter uh, Gewater, uh is the German counteroffensive, which I guess probably was Jupiter. Um... Six Army is trapped in Stalingrad and supplied with difficulty by airlift. Von Manstein has planned a daring operation to save it, but the time but time is against them. The German defenses along the Chir River are eroding, and soon the Soviets will launch Operation Saturn, which will force the German armies to fall back toward the west. So this is sort of the German counteroffensive that attempted to link up with the German troops that were cut off in Stalingrad and relieve them and let them escape. Um, the Langer campaign actually is combining both Fall Blau and the early stages campaign, which I skipped. Early stages basically is May to June of 42, which is sort of the preparatory operations. It's a very short scenario. It's only two or three turns long. And it basically looks at the siege of Sevastopol, or sorry, Sevastopol, uh, as well as some of the initial German offensives or counteroffensives aimed at bringing some pressure off Army Group 6, or Army Group, uh, sorry, the 6th Army uh, near Kharkov, and also the German drive toward Kerch on the Crimean Peninsula. Again, this is only two or three scenarios long, um, but it's an interesting short little scenario. So, um, with that being said, I'm probably going to lose because I always lose because I'm not quite sure how to fight sev- how, how to fight the battle of uh, Sevastopol. Uh, it's it's particularly challenging, um, but we'll we'll take a look at the Kharkov and Kerch offensive here uh, while we. We'll look at Fall Blau probably tomorrow. I'll probably live stream this tonight at around 9 o'clock, 9.30 Central Standard Time. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at Fall Blau um, more extensively. But just to kind of give you an idea of what this game looks like, we'll take a look at Kar- our Karkov and Kerch, the early stages, May to June of 42, sort of the uh, prelude scenario, if you will. So let's go ahead and jump in here as the Germans. So with all of these campaigns and battles, you get sort of generally little write-ups that kind of help you understand the current situation. So you can see going in here, First Fruits, 1941, was a trying year for the Wehrmacht. Not only the USSR is still standing, but the Red Army has also harshly counterattacked throughout the winter. Greatly diminished, German forces are preparing to revive the assault. There can no longer be any question of an attack on all fronts like last year, so a plan has been developed to destroy as many enemy forces as possible while seizing the oil wealth of the Caucasus. Until then, while we wait for our forces to be ready for the great summer offensive, cleaning up operations will be carried out in uh, regions of Izium and in the Crimea. In order to improve our starting positions and free the 11th Army to engage, uh, 11th Army engaged in Sevastopol, sorry, Sevastopol, for other operations. So you can see this mission here, we get a kind of overview of our objectives. So you'll earn victory points as follows. Capturing uh, Sevastopol will give us three points, and it'll free the 11th Army for uh, further operations during the summer. Uh, losing, for failing to take Sevastopol will result in losing three points, uh, which will be sort of a setback. Uh, if we drive the Soviets out of Kerch, we get two points. That's a bridgehead in Crimea that threatens our southern flank and must be reduced. And we also gain one point for every Soviet army that is destroyed. Uh, and that will, um, you know, obviously make the, the Soviets a weaker force that we're dealing with. Uh, we'll need at least six points to obtain a victory. Okay. Um, okay, so now we're back into the, the preparations here. A slow preparation. General Halder estimates that there's 720,000 men missing on the Eastern Front at the beginning of May. To repopulate our divisions, the cohort of 1922 and 23 are called in, but haven't been able to fully replenish our reserves. The material situation is also worrying. To equip the units involved in Fall Blau, it was necessary to unequip units from other fronts. More worryingly, only one-fifth of the 90,000 trucks lost since the beginning of the campaign in the East have been replaced, endangering what was has been our strength so far mobility so we basically are going to have to make uh, make a decision um, because of a slow preparation because it's taking a long time for us to get everything ready until july 15th army group south's troops are inactive in operations and gain supply and lose tiredness the northernmost troops will be served first and will be fully ready in june the tiredness of the units known in july um uh, blah 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 whatever let's just jump ahead Okay, so we have two options here. Uh, We now have an update that's basically saying, like, 
our, our operation is too ambitious. The Germans can't do this all by themselves. They need forces of their allies to support their offensive. We have more than 600,000 Italian, Ro- Romanian, and Hungarian troops fighting alongside us in this campaign, uh, but their military value is not very high. And so this is the first sort of strategic decision that we have to make. We can either choose to strip some of our German troops to equip these soldiers to make them more efficient, or we can keep the equipment for ourselves. Uh, historically, uh, perhaps to their own detriment, the Germans kept the equipment for themselves and let the Romanian and, and Hungarian and, and Italian troops, you know, fight with what they had, what their armies were able to provide them. And in many cases, that meant those troops were not well equipped, especially in the likes of anti-tank guns. So the Germans historically chose to keep their own equipment. And what this does is it decreases access cohesion by 10 and increases, or sorry, decreases access allies cohesion by one. So uh, access cohesion by 10 Uh, and Axis allies by one. If we go with equipping them, then you increase Axis cohesion by 10. You equip your allies by stripping German units, uh, decrease cohesion of North and Center Army Group units, and increase uh, the Axis allied cohesion. So, um, hmm. So basically, we're going to pull units out of Army Group Center and North I think that's fine in this scenario because we're only fighting in the South for this particular short scenario. So let's equip them. Okay. And now it's just giving us a general overview that our allies in the East, Japan, just lost or just fought the Battle of Coral Sea. And the Americans appear to be sort of coming in. So it's trying to it, it basically put you in the shoes of the German generals who know they've got to uh, quickly... Um, win, if you will. Okay, so uh, right now, uh, this is the front. So we can zoom out. You can see the entire front of World War II on the Eastern Front. Uh, The red areas over here represent uh, where the Soviet lines are. The gray represent the Germans. If there was one thing I really wish this game needs more than anything, it's better maps. The, The contrast between Soviet fronts and German fronts is just not very good. I guess this might be the best display of it. But it's still having a brighter red or a darker gray for the Germans to really help these two sides stand out um, would be helpful. Alas, that's not uh, currently available. These, this is all the screens here so far. Even this one, the gray is fine, but the, the red is white and it just, it doesn't really, doesn't really pop that way. So you can see these are all the different maps. Um, and I think we'll stick with this one. This seems like probably the most, uh, the best contrast here. So we can use the mouse wheel to scroll in and out. On the larger scenarios like Fall Blau, you're going to have Army Group Center, you're going to have Army Group North, and you will be in command of the entire front uh, during this particular campaign. We're not doing that for this short scenario, so let's go ahead and mouse wheel in. So we can see the Soviets have three different army groups here against us. We have Army Group South and the army uh, in Crimea. The Crimean army has no troops in reserve here. You can see they have two out of two railways for supplies, 50 trucks, eight air power, zero tanks, zero anti-tank guns, and zero infantry in reserve, and there's zero units in reserve. Uh, Army Group South is a little bit different. They've actually got quite a few units in reserve. So they've got the 1st Mountain Division, the 454th Security Division, the 3rd Romanian Corps, 2nd Romanian Mountain Corps. And this is an example of what equipping our allies changes. So by our decision to equip our allies, you can see here the 3rd Romanian Corps doesn't say obsolete equipment. So these guys um, have had their equipment improved, so that helps with their fighting abilities. The 2nd Romanian Mountain Division, however, still is using obsolete equipment. And so obsolete equipment uh, basically is saying it's fit maybe for 1939, but no longer sufficient to face a modern army. The fields of anti-tank and anti-aircraft warfare deficiencies are such that this unit would be practically defenseless in the event of an enemy armored attack. So those are kind of things to keep in mind. Uh, You can see there's other Romanian units here that are obsolete. Some of them aren't those. The Romanian cavalry divisions are actually okay. And then we've also got the second Hungarian army, which is pretty damn big. It's got 15 artillery units and nine infantry units and two armored units. That's a pretty strong army. Uh, We've got a Italian unit here that I believe is um, uh, obsolete. And then you've got uh, a Slovak uh, fast division, which is also obsolete. So we didn't fix all our problems. Some of our units are still obsolete, but these guys are all in reserve. So if we actually jump in here, we can see we've got a front line in Kursk where we've got the 4th Panzer Army uh, currently sitting here. You can see nine armored units, 13 artillery, five infantry, 33 trucks, as well as the 2nd Infantry Army, 
that are all currently in position. They're on a static front, so this is a defensive front. We have the Karakov front, which has a Soviet counteroffensive at Karakov going against it. The Sixth Army is here trying to refit. They're also entrenched. They're very strong. It's unlikely that the Soviets will break through with just infantry units. So we're doing okay there. South of Karakov, we have Operation Friedrichs, which might allow us to cut off. You can see this front line. If we drove north, we might be able to cut this entire Soviet force off, these five units off, uh, if we could link up with the troops up at Kursk. Uh, but you can see here we have the 1st Panzer Army here, which has quite a few armored units and artillery and other things like that. Currently, it's sitting in a static position. We have the Road to Rostov Front, uh, which has the 17th Army currently sitting, also in a static position, with the Soviet 12th, 18th, 37th, and 56th Armies all to its front. You can see these three armies, the 12th, 18th, and 37th, are all entrenched with these little uh, sort of pickaxe and shovel icons. That means they're entrenched. And you can see our intelligence tells us they have between four to eight infantry units, one to six trucks, which affects like their ability to do supply, two to six artillery, two to six tanks. You can see down here, this represents general skills. So that's a level two skill generals so and not a very good general, but they do have quite a bit of cohesion down here as well. How's our armored unit here? What's their cohesion? They're, they're almost full, but not quite. Um, and then if we go down into Crimea, we've got two different fronts in Crimea. We've got the battle for Sevastopol, or sorry, Sevastopol, uh, which includes the 54th German Corps, a siege artillery unit, and then a Romanian Mountain Corps. So these three units are all facing off against the Soviet Coastal Army, the, so the Sevas, uh, Se Sebastopol. Uh, Navy, barrier troops, which are kind of like border troops, and then the fortress of uh, Sevastopol, which is basically giant guns. So these are naval guns in the fortresses around uh, Sevastopol. Um, so, and, and that's facing off against our 54th Corps, the siege artillery, and then also our Romanian Mountain Corps. And that's the situation there. And then we also have a Kirsch uh, counteroffensive, which you remember will be worth two points. And that has the 22nd Panzer Division, which is apparently obsolete. Uh, and then the 30th Corps and a Group Mattenklot uh, unit here, which is primarily an infantry unit facing off against the Soviet 47th Army and 51st Army. So that's the situation in Kerch. Now, again, we only have two turns for this particular fight, so this is going to be a, a little bit on the shorter end here. You can see our victory objectives. We get three points for Sevastopol, two points for Kerch, and then if we destroy enemy units up here in the north, we gain some additional points. Uh, we can show weather. I, I don't know that weather really matters in this particular scenario. Um, and then what else? Air superiority. Um, yeah, it's a summary of different fronts. And uh, you can see here we have three command points for both army groups South and Crimea. So the first thing I think I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and issue orders for army group South to launch an offensive. I want to try and cut the troops off at Kharkov that are attacking in this direction. Their offensive is 15% of the way to Kharkov. They are launching a uh, Kessel operation. So two armored thrusts on each side of the line to try and surround the sixth army at Kharkov. So why can't I like, I want to zoom in not quite as much. Okay. All right. So I want to go ahead and try and cut these guys off. The way that I'm going to have to do that is probably with armored formations. My fourth Panzer army doesn't consist of, uh, of um, obsolete units. So I'm kind of tempted to break through, but I don't know what direction they'll break through. Uh, where are they right now? Will they drive south? Fall below phase one. No, they're probably going to drive east toward Vorenzath, whereas these guys down here would uh, would cut off the troops to the north. But they're made up of... Oh, these guys aren't obsolete. I thought it said they were obsolete. It does say they're pinned, though. So we'll go ahead and we'll do a breakthrough operation, which costs one of our three command points. And... What leaves us with two points left, these guys are pinned... Their attrition and tiredness is five, so they may not be as effective in terms of units. I'm also going to go ahead and pull the second Hungarian army forward into Operation Fredericks. It'll cost one command point to try and get them up to the front. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, send them to the front also. So these guys are not tired at all. At least it doesn't look like it. And then our attack will start next turn. So these two units are ready. The Hungarian army and the second, the first Panzer army are ready to drive north into the rear of this enemy formation. 
and we'll do that in our next turn. Meanwhile, next operation, oh, that's right, the, the armored troops in uh, Kerch are the ones that are, uh, are obsolete. So the problem here is I don't have enough command points down in Crimea. I can't adequately press east toward Kerch while also trying to take uh, Sevastopol. I, I just don't have the command points to do that. Um, I also don't even have an offensive set up at, at uh, Sevastopol. So if I go ahead and use one command point for a breakthrough here that allows me to attack the city, but I don't actually have any... <clears throat> I don't actually have any way to not spend one of my three command points doing that. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and do this. We'll spend one t point shelling. Actually, first things first, let's take the 54th Corps and let's assault the Soviets here. That destroys the coastal guns. So the fortress unit here is a skull and crossbones, means we destroyed this enemy unit. Uh, and so the, and the 54th Corps did it without taking much in the way of losses. That does leave us with one command point and two enemy units left. The coastal artillery is dug in. Um, I don't know if there's any way to prevent them from like from moving to a, a defense in depth. I don't think so because that's what's going to make it hard. So I guess we'll just do that and then we'll use our one other point here and assault the Soviet troops in Kerch. And so we just surrounded the 51st Army. So they'll be destroyed. The 47th Army still exists, but at least the 51st Army is surrounded and they're, have, they're, they're basically in trouble. So they'll probably bring these guys forward next turn, and then we'll see what we can do in, in Kerch here on turn two. So go ahead and zoom out. We'll go ahead and hit next turn and see what comes up. You can see here, helping the 6th Army. The violence of the attack on Karakov took us by surprise. General von Paulus even momentar momentarily lost his temper when he warned the high command that the 6th Army was fighting for its survival. The situation would not be so worrying if one of our largest supply poles was not located less than 20 kilometers away from Soviet troops. Considerable amounts of fuel, ammunition, and supplies accumulated there for months. It is anticipated in uh, of the Blau plan could fall into the hands of the enemy. A transient alert or a real threat at the general staff. Opinions are divided. Should we immediately launch Operation Friedrichus on the Isthmus salient to reduce the pressure on the 6th Army and surround the Soviets? Or should we continue our preparations for the main offensive without being distracted? If we continue our preparations, we gain one cohesion and supplement our numbers in the 17th Army uh, and the 1st Panzer Army, but they'll both be pinned down while gaining one supply. If we launch Operation Friedrichs, the 17th Army is no longer pinned, the 1st Army is no longer pinned, and Operation Friedrichs is launched. Army Group South Command gets plus 2 this turn, and the 1st Panzer Group gains 1 supply. We're going to launch it just because it gives me more to do in this very short battle. So go ahead and launch Operation Friedrichs, and you can see that we're unpinned and able to go. Uh, the state of preparedness for Fall Blau is going on. Fall Blau phase one, second army tiredness minus two, Panzer army tiredness minus two, 17th red army tiredness and attrition minus one, and then uh, army group south plus five trucks and army group south plus one strategic rail capacity. We will be ready soon. Now, all, this entire phase is built into the long campaign, but not into Fall Blau. So the campaign will probably be playing starting tomorrow, which is much larger, which involves the drive on Stalingrad. Um, we'll not... Um, include this but once you earn enough points in that then you can sort of do uh, a grand campaign all the way from may until until 43. okay so if we zoom in here on Kharkov, we can see that the soviets attacked again uh, and one of their armies was actually cut off the 28th army was cut off by counterattacks by the sixth army and so it has been encircled that's good news for us we can also see that the air superiority in the sector is currently disrupted. The Soviets sent 21st Corps into the theater for some extra reserves. And so now the 21st Soviet Corps, 57th Army, and 9th Armies are all currently here. So what do, what do we do now? Um, we have five command points uh, with which to use. Uh, the 1st Panzer Army's not fully coherent. You can see its cohesion is almost full, but not quite. It does have three fuel and three ammo, and we have five points here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a blitz attack, which is going to use one ammo, one fuel, and two air power. If we go back to the theater, um, if we go back to the operation, we have, I think, 16 aviation. So we've got quite a bit of aviation here. We're going to do a blitz attack, which basically represents uh, air power, tactical air, and then and then an armored uh, thrust. So we'll go ahead and do that. You can see that initial blitz attack here made the operation proceed 13%. 
And then you can also see that we encircled the Soviet 9th Army. That still leaves the 57th Army and the 21st Tank Corps, however, for us to deal with. So we're also going to go ahead and launch another blitz attack again by the 1st Panzer Army and see if we can make it a little bit further. We'll do that, and you can see here we encircled the 57th Soviet Army as well. And there you have it. So we've encircled both of these Soviet armies, which are up near the front line. Um, we're at 26%. Kind of tempted to assault with the 2nd Hungarian Army. And you can see here Soviet losses, 1 artillery, 2 infantry, 3 cohesion. We gained 2%. I think we attacked the 9th Army in that infantry attack. I'm not sure if we do another blitz, we wipe out this first Soviet army that we had surrounded, but we're not actually hitting the enemy armor because they're, they're further back. And that also does use up the last remaining ammunition for our armored formation there. So we could, if we airlifted to give them more supplies, that would be the last of our command points for the turn. We're down to one. So we have one command point left. We could also, if we go back to Kharkov, we could try and have the 6th Army launch an offensive, which might finish off the 28th Army, which is surrounded. Or we could use our Hungarian Army to launch another assault here. Perhaps it was a mistake for me to do the Hungarian attack. I should have kept attacking with our armor because then we would have had one more command point left to reinforce. We could, we could basically do another resupply and then another attack with our armor if I hadn't done that. But I don't know if we would have destroyed that enemy armor if we had done that either. So I'll attack with my Hungarian troops here and we'll whittle down the 57th Army, but we haven't destroyed it. And that does it for Army Group South this turn. And we weren't able to complete the operation. We got up to 46%, but we weren't able to get north if we had gotten north to Kursk we would have cut all of these troops off uh, we are obviously not very close to doing that so I'm not sure what the best strategy is to try and accomplish that still a very meaningful turn 46 percent in an operation is quite a bit I'm wondering if the 17th army should have launched some assaults to the east I I'm not sure because they're dug in down here meanwhile if we move to Crimea here we can see that uh, are these guys Huh. I'm not sure why these guys are like faded out. I'm curious. Can I save and then maybe come back depending on, I should have saved at the start of the turn and then come back to see what our other, what other results would have occurred. So if we go here, we can see the coastal army is switched to defense and depth, which will make them much more difficult to destroy. We'll go ahead and shell them with our heavy guns. You can see that destroyed one artillery, five infantry, and lost them one cohesion. If I shell them a second time, one in artillery, two infantry, one cohesion, still against the defense and depth unit, and then assault with the 54th Corps, three artillery, three cohesion, but we didn't destroy them. And so I think that kind of cost us to, I don't think we, we're going to fail because I think that's it for this campaign. You can see a major defeat. We did destroy some Red Army units, but not as many as we would like. We got three, one point for that, and we failed to take uh, Sevastopol, so minus three. So if I go back and load the game, I'm curious if we focus on Kerch instead, does that make a difference? Yeah, I should. Let's do that in a different order. And this isn't, by the way, this is the way I'm playing it out here. This is much more puzzly, but that's because it's such a limited front and such a small scenario. There's a lot of paths to victory in the, in the bigger battles. So what if we do blitz here? Okay, so we wipe that enemy unit out. And then proceed. So we took Kerch at least. So that's nice. So we ended up taking Kerch by doing that, although we bypassed uh, Sevastopol. And so it still gives me a defeat. You've got to get a huge amount of points. This is a very challenging scenario, this very small scenario. Um, but you can see here, we did manage to inflict two points for Red Army losses. We gained two points for taking Kerch, um, although we ended up failing at Sevasto or Sevastopol in the sense that we didn't take the objective because, frankly, I didn't have enough command points. Now, this is a very, very small scenario. If you take a look at Fall Blau, you can see it's a much different situation here. We're just going to jump on through um, and see what this what this looks like. 
So if we jump into Fall Blah, you can see you've got the entire front line of the Eastern Front that you deal with. Um, you still apparently start off with the Soviets surrounded at Sevastopol. Um, is it June? Is it really? Yeah, it's June 28th. Okay. So Crimea starts with four command points. So we could just start, you know, assaulting the Soviets here on this on this front. Presumably, we would we would cut them off pretty quick. We've we just like that, just by clicking a few buttons, I've destroyed the coastal army and the fortress guns. Uh, we'll do a reverse front, which I think will will do quite a bit of damage to the remaining uh, navy here. So we'll probably take this enemy city here next turn. And then, if you can see here, the offensive is going to start near uh, Kar near Karakov. You can see this initial uh, Kessel operation. Um, but this isn't all you have to deal with either. Like you've got two command points in the north. You've got units in reserve that you can move around. Uh, you've got units on the front. And the Soviets will launch counteroffensives up here in the north as well. You can also launch some of your own offensives here. Not likely ever going to take Moscow in the face of all these troops, but it is something you can do that may convince the Soviets your drive is for Moscow and may cause them to pull troops out of the, the front in the south and make your, your offensive more likely to succeed. Um, you can see here, this is the 17th Army who's going to drive toward the Caucasus. You can see these are major objective centers, these different oil facilities down here in the south. And then you can see here's our initial Kessel operation. We've got a whole bunch of Soviet armies sort of to our front. And then we've got the first and fourth Panzer armies uh, on our offensive. So just we'll show you the first turn here. So if we go to Blitz attack, we immediately wiped out the ninth Soviet army. You can see the Soviet losses down here and 49% of the way to our objective. We'll go ahead and launch a Blitz offensive with the fourth Panzer army now as well. And then you can see here we cut off another enemy unit. We made 42% progress there. And then you can see the casualties inflicted on them. Uh, that leaves us with 9% still needing, needing to go. Now, these troops, because they launched breakthrough operations, are isolated. They have stretched lines and exposed flanks. So we have some other options with them. Now that they're out in the front, we can do a deep raid, which basically causes them to keep pushing into the enemy rear. We can reverse the front, which basically has them turn around and encircle units behind them, but does prevent their forward progress from making as much progress. We can do a defensive withdrawal somewhere around here. Actually, I don't even see that, but sometimes you can do a defensive withdrawal that like pulls you back to get rid of your isolated and exposed lines. Uh, you can do scouting, <clears throat> which I assume just gives you better intel on the enemy. Hedgehog defense, so you can split the force into multiple units. You can bombard and shell them, airlift them for more supplies, all those kind of things. What I'm actually going to do here is I'm just going to assault with the 6th Army to try and kind of break through and get this to 100% progress. So we'll do that. You can see we encircled several more enemy units, made 3% progress. We'll assault again. We got to 100% progress, encircled three enemy armies, destroyed a fourth one, and then there's the 28th and 38th Armies back here. We still have two points in Army Group South. You can see how the front line changed. We're out toward Vordenzenth, and we're making our drive on the Dawn and Stalingrad. So we've immediately gotten a breakthrough here near between Kursk and Karakov. We have two new fronts. Uh, we have the, the Boyan, the Sonza River, uh, which includes the 2nd Army, and then the 21st Soviet Army is, is here and cut off. Uh, and then we also have the race along the Dawn here with the German armored formations. Um, and then we can see that there's four Soviet armies that are all cut off here uh, and surrounded. So I think if we go ahead with a breakthrough uh, and then we do a blitz, we make a 21% progress. We finish off one of those Soviet armies and we make quite a bit of progress toward the uh, objective at Stalingrad while holding on the defensive in the north. And that's just sort of an example of this first turn. If we go ahead and move to the second turn, you can see a question of should we take Vornazeth? Uh, a few days travel from our troops position extends the region of Vornazeth. The city is an important railway junction to the Soviets. So the capture of the city by the Wehrmacht would greatly complicate the logistics of the Red Army. The region also has an important Soviet aircraft factory. Finally, attacking the city would deceive the enemy about our intentions by making them believe that Moscow is our main objective. If von Bock is, is a strong supporter of attacking the city, Hitler and Halder believe that the capture of Vornazeth would distract us from our main objective to surround and destroy the enemy in the Dawn Loop uh, while we're engaged in a speedy race with an enemy en route. So we basically can choose to continue the operations at Vornazov, which will decrease the Soviet convictions uh, of an attack on Moscow, or take Vornazeth, uh, which opens up uh, the city to capture. 
and uh, increases the Soviet conviction of an attack on Moscow. Vornazeth is now worth one victory point. So if we do this, then you can see Vornazeth becomes a front. And also, if we take it, then it may reduce the amount of reinforcements the Soviets send south to, to stop us. So we have eight command points in the south here. If I go to Vornazeth, you can see the enemy army here is already surrounded because of our success in the last battle. So that should hopefully make things a little bit easier. I'm going to go ahead and use one point for breakthrough, two for a blitz. Um, that didn't quite work the way I wanted to. Yeah, I'm definitely getting distracted because we did pull the first Panzer Army off of our attack along the Don. So this may have been a mistake. These guys are surrounded, but I haven't been able to destroy them yet. And I've already used half my command points just in these few seconds here. So let's go back over here. Um, they did counterattack against our fourth Panzer Army. We're dealing with the 40th enemy army and the 12th army here. So we'll go ahead and we're at 21%. Six army, just assault. That didn't make a lot of progress. Do supply. We use six trucks, lost one. What's their fuel and ammo situation? Reverse front, deep raid. That didn't really make much progress. So we kind of got stalled here, potentially because I pulled one entire Panzer army away from my front line. Let's see if we can free up more troops by taking Sevastopol. All right. So we took the city there, leaves us with one command point in the Crimea, but all these troops get thrown into reserve. So we're going to take the one of these forces. Probably don't need the siege artillery. Which are the strongest here? Looks like the Grupa Madenklot have the most artillery and infantry. So we're going to go ahead and send them to Army Group South. Actually, let's refit that. Oh, do they need to be refit? They don't. Yeah, let's send them to Army Group South. So now they'll move up to Army Group South's headquarter here. And I'm just kind of ignoring the Moscow and the rest of the fronts for the moment, but those will heat up over time. So if we go ahead and move to the next turn, we're making good progress, drive to the east, keep army group south, to Stalingrad. I'm not really reading through these. We're just kind of jumping through. So you can see Vornazeth is still being fought over. Looks like the enemy 38th army surrendered, but there's some enemy unit here that is opposing the first Panzer army. So I'm just going to blitz against, whoa, the 6th Reserve Army, and somehow our troops ended up surrounded? Well, that was a mistake. <laughs> I might have to send some reserves from Army Group South over that way. Meanwhile, the race along the dawn. The Soviet troops that we did have facing us were all surrounded, so they all actually did... If you can see here, they actually the 12th Army retreated and the 40th Army surrendered. Okay. So we just sort of used our the rest of our turns to make progress along the dawn. We got up to like 80% or so. And the rest of these troops all moved up to the next headquarters units here, so... So we're into July, we're racing along the dawn. The enemy has moved one unit, the 18th Army, in front of us. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch a blitz offensive against him. We wiped him out and completed the operation there. So we wiped out another Soviet Army in the open with this armored formation. And now we have another front here, the dawn loop, uh, which you can see here once we go on to the uh, breakthrough offensive, we're gonna be making our drive on Stalingrad itself. But you can see this is a very narrow front. Again, the maps don't do a good job of showing it. But this is a very narrow front between the Soviets, so it's very isolated, and enemy counterattacks could potentially pose a problem for us. I wish these maps looked a little bit more. I wish they popped a bit more. Meanwhile, Vornazeth, our troops are entrenched. I can't break through these guys. It's all because I, I basically dug myself into a hole where I'm dealing with a... Uh, 
with a, a city battle here with armored formations. Also, apparently, the second Hungarian army peeled off to guard our left flank. So this is going to get into very Stalingrad-like situations. Where we're driving on Stalingrad, but as we drive, some of these troops that are in that offensive have to be peeled off to guard the flanks. And right now, we've got the second Hungarian army guarding this flank. Now, there's no Soviet troops opposite at the moment, but that's very vulnerable that they could counterattack south toward Rostov or something like that and, and deal us uh, uh, some challenges. Meanwhile, I also do need to keep in mind we've got the 17th Army. We, we do want to try and, uh, you know, drive toward the oil fields. Those are major objectives in this particular campaign. And so we've got to drive on Rostov, which I've just finally started committing some resources and points to doing. And, and so we just, you know, attacked and destroyed that Soviet Army. But we're, we're behind schedule there as well. So... We're just kind of blitzing through this and, and just sort of giving an example of what this game is. Uh, there's more stuff to do up north. The Soviets will also start like launching offensives. They're refitting their army on the Moscow front, but they will they will launch offensives here as well. So it's just, you know, different things to keep in mind and, and different things to manage. And, you know, you've got reserves and other things you can do across the front. The game is primarily focused on the operations towards Stalingrad, but there are other things to, to sort of keep you busy elsewhere. The oil fields in the Caucasus, you can see here represented on the map, are all important. They give you different amounts of victory points toward taking your objective. Obviously, Stalingrad also factors into that. Uh, but it's a really interesting looking game. It's made by one guy. Uh, the biggest complaint I have is the maps just don't look very good. Some of the UI takes a little bit of getting used to, but I hope that this was useful and, and kind of helping you guys understand a little bit of that. Uh, and I think we'll play this a little bit more. So this was my very first look at Cauldrons of War Stalingrad. Uh, uh, the game, like I said, either comes out today or on the 26th. So there's a link to the Steam page if you want to check it out. And we'll probably stream this tonight on the Twitch channel around 9.30 Central Standard Time. If you're interested in joining, there's a link to my Twitch channel there. I haven't streamed as much lately. Uh, this week's been a little bit quiet. That's because I got a new PC, and I was kind of getting things set up and then getting things transferred over. Uh, but I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I ended up getting a, an i9 uh, 10900K. Uh, which I know everybody's like AMD's all the rage, which is fine, but this is a very good uh, processor. It may not be up to like all of the, some of the higher end thread rippers, but I couldn't find any of those and I got this for a good price. So pretty excited about that. Uh, and uh, yeah, with that being said, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Leave your thoughts down below. It is a bare bones game in a lot of ways, especially UI, especially mapping. I believe the game's made by one person. I, I think it, is it only like five bucks? The previous game was only like five bucks. I don't see what the price is going to be on here yet, but I imagine it won't be more than 10. Um, and it's a really interesting sort of challenging game. And I'm, I'm curious to see how this all unfolds and how it plays when I spend a little bit more time on the grand campaign. With that being said, guys, hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out.